Haruki Murakami writes this, Why do people have to be this lonely? What's the point of it all? Millions of people in this world, all of them yearning, looking to others to satisfy them, yet isolating themselves. Why? Was the earth put here just to nourish human loneliness? From Rudyard Kipling. We're all islands shouting lies to each other across seas of misunderstanding. Jody Picoult. If you meet a loner, no matter what they tell you, it's not because they enjoy solitude. It's because they've tried to blend into the world before, and people continue to disappoint them. We live in the most technologically connected world in history. And yet, some of the most common experiences in our culture are of alienation, estrangement, and loneliness. We have hundreds or even thousands of Facebook friends, Twitter and Instagram followers. Many people text incessantly, post pictures habitually, and update their status constantly. And yet, our common experience is of loneliness and isolation. We're looking for connections, but the ones we find don't seem to satisfy. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. In the blue pew Bible, it's page 942. Romans 5, page 942, which was our New Testament reading for this morning. Not only do we experience alienation from each other, but far more fundamental to our human condition is alienation and estrangement from God himself. We're made to have deep and lasting relationship with God, but we don't experience that as we should. Something has gone wrong so that we are distant from the God who is ever-present. Something's gotten in the way and separated us from God. Our relationship with him is damaged and broken. But it's worse than that. More than mere separation from God, the Bible speaks of human enmity with God. Look at verse 10 in Romans 5. For while we were enemies, or in the Isaiah reading, Isaiah 63, God became his people's enemy because of their rebellion and rejection of him. Because of sin, we have placed ourselves on the side of evil and set ourselves up as God's enemies. We said this last week when we talked about the word propitiation, that God is always and unambiguously against evil. God is always the enemy of evil, and evil is always the enemy of God. And because of our sin, we've aligned ourselves on the wrong side. While redemption, our word from two weeks ago, points to our slavery to sin, Propitiation, our word from last week, points to God's wrath towards us as sinners. And reconciliation, our worthy word for today, points to our estrangement and alienation and enmity with God. Reconciliation is a relationship word. It's a family word. It speaks of our need to be reunited and put into right relationship with God. Reconciliation points to a restored relationship with God. Now, as with the other worthy words in our series, in order to understand the good news of what God has done and what our words point us to, the the facets of what God has done, of understanding what God has done on the cross, in order to understand the good news, you have to understand what the word points to as being the bad news. There, there is no good news until you actually understand the bad news first. And the bad news that reconciliation points us to is the fact that our relationship with God has been broken because of sin. Because of sin, we've actually set ourselves up as God's enemies. The bad news for us is that God's perfect justice will not and cannot tolerate sin and evil. Evil has to be dealt with, not merely brushed aside and ignored. The deep-seated offense of sin towards God has to be dealt with in order for reconciliation to be complete and lasting. For God 
and humans to be reconciled, God has to actually overcome sin, not merely ignore it. And that is precisely what's done on the cross. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God has decisively dealt with the problem of sin and separation from God. In Christ's saving work on the cross, the separation between us and God because of sin is destroyed. God has dealt with our sin that otherwise makes us his enemies. God reconciles us to himself. He acts on our behalf to reconcile us with him. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, God deals decisively with the enmity between him and us because of our sin. He makes restoration of our relationship with him possible through Jesus' death on the cross. So what is the result of reconciliation with God? What's the result of having a right and restored relationship with God? The result of reconciliation with God is peace with God. Look with me at Romans 5.1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus has accomplished through his death death and resurrection, through his work in reconciling us to God, we can finally be at peace with God. No longer enemies because of our sin, but at true peace with a just and holy God. Scripture in numerous places, I've merely mentioned two today, speaks of us as God's enemies because of sin. But now, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf, we can be at peace with him. In our reading from John 20 this morning, what, uh, after Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he comes and appears to his disciples, what's the first thing he says to them? Peace be with you. Uh, It says this, uh, John 20, 19 and following. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. This is the first time in human history since the fall that human beings can have true peace with God. Because Jesus has decisively dealt with sin on the cross, rising again victorious on the third day, defeating sin and death. We can be at peace with God. And so the very first thing he has to say to his disciples when he's raised is that they now have peace with God. The result of Jesus reconciling us to God is that we can have peace with God. Turn with me this time to in the green service booklet that you have. Not in the Bible this time. Turn with me to page 6 in the green service booklet. Page 6. In our worship service, we sing, we read from Scripture, We hear a sermon preached on the one or more of the passages that's read. We pray. And then on page six, we confess our sins. We acknowledge that we've sinned. And then we hear the words of absolution. God's promise to forgive those who turn to him in faith. We confess our sins. Then through what Jesus has done for us, we hear his words of forgiveness. And then what comes right after that? The peace. That's put in that order on purpose. That was an intentional decision to put those things in that order so that every week we walk through the process of confessing our sins, hearing God's words of forgiveness and reconciliation to us, and then being reminded that because of that, we can be at peace with God. And then we go around and remind each other of our new status as being at peace with God. Believe it or not, it is not designed as a sort of seventh inning stretch. (laughs) It's designed so that you can remind each other and be reminded 
of the peace that we have with God because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. So as you go around today and share the peace with each other, hear again and again and again and again the promise and the reaffirmation that because of what Jesus has accomplished on your behalf, you can have peace with God. Jesus has accomplished reconciliation so that we can be at peace with him. And now, because we have been reconciled to God, because we are at peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us, now we have access to God. Because we're at peace with him, because the enmity between us and God has been removed, we can, be, we can have access to our Heavenly Father. Look at Romans 5, 2. So, uh, I didn't tell you today. I was thinking it. I'm going to make you bounce around a little bit. Romans 5, 2. Through Jesus, we have also obtained access. Ephesians 2, 18. For through Jesus, we have access to the Father. God has reconciled us to himself and given us access to a restored and right relationship with him. God wants to have a relationship with us, and he's made that available. He wants it so badly that even though we are the ones who've done the offending, we are the offending parties, we're the ones who caused the problem in the first place, God acts on our behalf to reconcile us to him. So turn to him. Receive him. Trust him. Access to God is made available to you. Now we have access to our Heavenly Father. We can meet with him. We can pray to him. We can, as Hebrews 10 says, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. We can read his word without condemnation. We can receive him as he gives himself to us in the Eucharist. We can have communion with him. God has done this work of reconciliation, providing a way for us to have restored relationship with him. So be in relationship with him. Spend time with him. You have the opportunity to have a relationship with the God of the universe. You have access and peace with your heavenly father. But relationships don't just happen spontaneously. You need to spend time with God. You need to pray daily. It doesn't have to be fancy, but you need to communicate with God daily. Occasionally, my wife Tracy and I have days or even a week where we just feel like ships passing in the night. And we can tell. <laughs> Our relationship is affected by going that long without meaningful communication with each other. Spouses need to communicate with each other, and you need to communicate with God, your Heavenly Father. And you need to read the Bible daily. This is God's Word, His self-revelation through His written Word for us, and we need to take seriously what it is He's given us and spend time in it, reading it, and learning it feels a little silly to say this to a group of people that have come to church today, but you need to come to church. <laughs> That's not an optional part of being a Christian. That's actually an essential part of being a Christian, is coming together and worshiping as God's restored and reconciled family. The God of the universe has made a way for you to be in relationship with him. There is no greater joy in the world we're so isolated and lonely in large part due to the fact that we don't have the kind of meaningful and deep relationship with God that we should. Now, I'm not belittling genuine, deep loneliness in a fallen and sinful and broken world. That is real and painful. But the primary reason, or the, the single biggest reason that we experience that as often as we do is because we don't have the relationship with God that we were made to have. Again, I'm not belittling genuine brokenness and pain in a broken world. But God, hey, the relationship that we were made to have with God himself is available to us. 
as St. Augustine has said, we are restless until we rest in Him. We were made for a relationship with God, and because God has reconciled us to Himself, that relationship is possible. So draw near to God as He has given you access. Today we bring uh, this mini-series to a close when we've done what I've been calling some of the worthy words of the Bible. And each of the three that we've looked at in the last three weeks point to a different element of our fallen condition, a different element, a different result of sin, but then also point us to a different facet of the goodness of God and what he's done on our behalf. And if you notice, all three of them kind of describe our human situation and none of them are particularly flattering to us. In redemption, it points to our captivity and slavery and subjection to sin. Propitiation, from last week, points to God's wrath towards sin and towards sinners that needs to be turned away. And today, reconciliation points to our enmity with God because of our sin. But then all of these words then also point to the amazing and incredible goodness of God in what he's done on our behalf in accomplishing salvation for us. God is the one who makes salvation possible. We messed it up, and God fixes it. God is the one who redeems, who propitiates, and who reconciles. In redemption, God buys us back through the death and resurrection of Jesus. In propitiation, God propitiates himself, turns his own wrath away from us through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross in our place. And in reconciliation, God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus' death on the cross. Luke 1.68, God has visited us and redeemed his people. 1 John 4.10, God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.18, God reconciled us to himself through Christ. This is God's work on our behalf. As a man named William Temple has said, all is of God. The only thing of my very own which I contribute to my redemption is the sin from which I need to be redeemed. It is God who makes redemption, propitiation, and reconciliation possible. So you must turn to him in faith. You can't redeem yourself from the slavery to sin. You can't turn away God's wrath and his indignation and just punishment for sin. And you can't reconcile yourself to God. The problem of evil is far too great. So you and I must trust in what Jesus has done on our behalf. He has redeemed us, bought us back from our slavery to sin. He has propitiated God's wrath. He's propitiated himself on our behalf. And he has reconciled us to God so that we can have a restored and right relationship with God. God, in his great love, acts on our behalf, acts for us, to make the way to freedom and reconciliation possible. Let's pray. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Thank you for redemption, for buying us back from sin and death, for propitiation, for turning your own wrath towards evil and sin away from us through the sacrifice of Jesus in our place, and for reconciliation, for removing sin from us, for making peace with us and restoring our relationship with you. We thank you for these worthy words, that they remind us of all that Jesus has done for us.
it is in his name that we pray.